It's good to see you again. Um, in our last lecture, we were learning about the causation of the Great Depression. Um, I'm hopeful that at this point you know that it wasn't one thing or another. It was all of these things that are all crashing down, and they're all doing so simultaneously. Even more important than the causation is the response to the Great Depression, which under the presidency of Herbert Hoover is not very much. You're going to find out why here in just a few minutes. But for right now, guys, um, I want to talk a little bit about the approaches to addressing this massive, massive crisis in American history. As a matter of fact, most historians, myself included, consider the Great Depression to be the greatest crisis faced by the United States, at the very least since the Civil War. Um, but in any case, uh, let's meet the players here, right? Herbert Hoover. Here's a guy that, that really is a victim of circumstances. Uh, in my opinion, Hoover was a victim of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, I think, and I'm not alone here, but I think had he been elected in 1920 or 1924, he would have gone down in history as being, at the worst, a relatively forgettable president. And at best, he would be um, you know, remembered quite favorably, considering that the economy is pretty good in those years. right? But he comes into the presidency in, 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 the, in the early months of 1929, and he's going to be in the White House when the economy crashes. Um, Hoover didn't cause the Great Depression, right? Uh, the problem is the way that he responded to the Great Depression um, w did not exactly scream, I get it, and I feel your pain, your suffering, and I'm going to do something about it. It certainly did not send that message. The question becomes why. In so many ways, Herbert Hoover really exemplifies, maybe even defines, the 19th century American dream, right? Hoover was from Iowa, and no disrespect to the Hawkeye State, it's not exactly known for producing presidents. He was orphaned at an early age. Um, he was a self-made millionaire by the time that he was 30 years of old, or 30, 30 years of age. He had served in Democratic presidencies under Woodrow Wilson. He had served in Republican presidencies in the 1920s. As a matter of fact, there was nobody that was seen as more suitable, more prepared to become president in 1928 when he was elected than Herbert Hoover. It was almost seen as a foregone conclusion. What Herbert Hoover is going to become is essentially a victim of his own political philosophy, which always had emphasized individualism. Remember, that was a really core value of the 19th century, and it emphasized that uh, you need to do this on your own. You can't have any kind of governmental handouts. And Hoover just got it in his head that he would do more harm than he would good if he intervened in the crisis directly. If he gave people to turn the heat, gave people money to turn the heat back on in their apartment, if he gave people money to make rent at the end of the month, that, that would poison the well of individualism, and that simply was not a road that he was willing to go down. Instead, what he wanted the American economy to do is form these cooperatives, what he called cooperative associations. Let me make something clear. Hoover's no idiot, right? He's very, very bright. As a matter of fact, he's going to get a full-ride scholarship to study engineering at the brand-new Stanford University. Not too many people that are not very, very smart are able to say that, right? But Hoover, Herbert Hoover understood that the Great Depression was a collective problem. And if we were ever to get, get it, going to get out of this hole, we were going to need a collective solution to it. And so what he wanted people to do is have workers to get together with their bosses, get together with farmers, get together with consumers, and collectively agree to make sacrifices. He wanted workers to voluntarily agree not to work five days out of the week, only work three, so that they could make room for their fellow workers. He wanted employers to voluntarily not lower prices anymore, because when you lower prices, you've got to find a way to make that back up in the market. And typically, the way that that's done is you lay off workers, right? 
Essentially, Hoover was asking the American economy to do something that it simply was not capable of doing, right? Um, there's too much to gain, and you've got, you've got pretty much nothing to lose by cutting corners. And so, there's, in this day and age, there's a lot of people that like to point to Herbert Hoover as this untaken road that had we really believed in him and re-elected him and, and, and embraced the Hoover alternative, we could have dreaded this great big massive government takeover of American life. I find that to be a little bit wanting. I think that Hoover's response was way, way, way too little. Uh, by the time that he was actually responding, it was way, way, way too late. And so it should go without saying that Americans are not going to turn to Hoover in 1932. Instead, they're going to turn to this guy, arguably the most important person in the 20th century, at least from the American standpoint. Everything that Herbert Hoover was, Franklin Roosevelt was not. Hoover was a farm boy who kind of earned his way uh, by, by, by the sweat of his brow into Stanford. Franklin Roosevelt was a member of a very wealthy family that traced its wealth back generations and generations and generations to the colonial Dutch, right? We know of this individual. I've talked about him before. He had run for president, as a matter of fact, in 1920 on that ticket that got buried by Harding and Coolidge. One of the things that we didn't talk about was his bout with polio. Polio was a disease. I emphasize the word was. Um, we, we vaccinate against it now. It's pretty much eradicated. But uh, back during this time period, it was an infantile disease that would paralyze people. And Franklin Roosevelt, in the aftermath of the, uh, of the election in 1920, he had gone to his lake house. and He was swimming with his children. And that night, he complained that he just felt funny. He couldn't really describe it better than that, but he felt strange. He went upstairs, and he lied down, went to bed, and that was the last time he ever walked. Um, if you've ever seen pictures, photographs of FDR uh, in a wheelchair, it's because he never walked again after that bout with polio, 1920-1921, right? It's really going to be his wife, a lady by the name of Eleanor Roosevelt, that will keep the family name alive in the circles of American politics. Eleanor Franklin, this is not the first time that we've mentioned the name Roosevelt. Eleanor Roosevelt was one of the favorite nieces of former President Theodore Roosevelt, making Franklin Roosevelt and Eleanor Roosevelt cousins. They were distant cousins, but they were cousins all the same. The Theodore Roosevelt variety, that branch of the family, was what we call the Oyster Bay Roosevelts. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt's branch was the Hyde Park Roosevelts. Both traced their roots back to colonial Dutch um, um, immigrants, and both of them had really become very, very wealthy, generally by ownership of the land. So once again, it's not just that he was wealthy, uh, Herbert Hoover had zero in common with Franklin Roosevelt when it comes to fancy prep schools and having basically everything at his, uh, at his fingertips. My point in telling you this is that there's very little that would make it think, at least on the surface level, that Franklin Roosevelt would really resonate with the American people. I'll explain why I think that here in a second, but for us, just for a minute. It's really going to be Eleanor Roosevelt that keeps that family name alive uh, when Franklin Roosevelt is, is struggling with his polio. But by the late 1920s, one of his good friends, a fellow New Yorker and current senator, a guy that we've also talked about in this class, Al Smith, is going to encourage Franklin Roosevelt to run for the governorship of the state of New York. As a matter of fact, it's going to be Franklin Roosevelt that will introduce Al Smith in the Democratic National Convention in 1928, describing him as that happy warrior from New York, Al Smith. Um, we know that Al Smith got destroyed by Herbert Hoover in 1928. Franklin Roosevelt won. Franklin Roosevelt was the governor of New York in 1928. And let me tell you something. He didn't see the Great Depression coming any more than Hoover, any more than anybody else in American life. He just didn't see it. 
Um, but what he was willing to do is he was willing to try new things and to experiment. One of the things that he's having a little bit of success in doing is putting unemployed New Yorkers, both New York staters as well as New York City residents, putting them to work on state money doing state projects, right? And so naturally, it comes across to the American voting public, New York and elsewhere, here's a guy that maybe we can rally around. Roosevelt might have an idea or two as to how we can pull ourselves out of this Great Depression. Roosevelt is going to become the nominee for the Democratic uh, uh, Party in 1932's presidential election. Um, before I go any further, what I want you to understand when it comes down to the sheer difference between FDR and Herbert Hoover was that Roosevelt could appreciate the suffering of the American people much, much more than Herbert Hoover was able to, right? And I think one reason as to why, I don't think, I mean, in my mind, this is very, very clear, it was his suffering from polio. When you don't have the ability to use your legs, you can really appreciate the idea that somebody that's been thrown out of work, it, it's not their fault that they're thrown out of work. It's not their fault that they can't find a job. There are no jobs. It's not their fault that they can't really provide for themselves or their families. They're victims of their circumstances. And so I think that that was really what kind of clicked with Franklin Roosevelt and getting it, so to speak, appreciating the severity of the crisis more than Herbert Hoover was able to do. To really put an exclamation point on this, one of the endeavors, one of the things that was very near and dear to his heart was a polio rehabilitation center in Georgia, um, a town that Roosevelt would, would risk a third of his inheritance, millions and millions of dollars, when he purchased it and renamed it Warm Springs, Georgia. Now, what Warm Springs was, if, if you're following along with me on the PowerPoint, you're looking at Franklin Roosevelt sitting poolside there. Warm Springs, sort of like Hot Springs, Arkansas, it offered these uh, natural um, uh, bodies of water that would be heated by, uh, by, 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 by the earth, right? And Franklin Roosevelt felt that they were just so good for the rehabilitation of his legs that he felt compelled to buy the place and open it up to pretty much anybody that was willing to send themselves or their loved ones to Warm Springs to be rehabilitated as well. Now, this obviously never does get him to walk again, but there are hundreds, dozens of, uh, of people, most of whom are children because polio is an infantile disease. They're all sent to Warm Springs, Georgia, and this really does come across as a guy who truly does get it, right? Here we have people like Herbert Hoover, who's not firing General MacArthur for burning down a veteran encampment. And on the flip side of the coin, you've got FDR that's offering up more or less free health care for those individuals that have been crippled by this really terrible disease. I think this really is the direct connection that resonated with so many millions and millions of Americans. But in 1932, what you've got is a situation where it's almost impossible for Herbert Hoover to be reelected. On the same time, you've got Franklin Roosevelt, who doesn't have the responsibility of running the country, and he can sit back and not only criticize, but he can also cheerlead for America. FDR promised that he had a secret plan for ending the Great Depression, something he referred to as the New Deal. But aside from that, he really didn't let any secrets out of the bag. He would keep his cards very close to his vest for the duration of the campaign. But if you're looking at the PowerPoint, you're seeing a very, very blue map. And not only are you seeing a lot of blue, you're seeing a lot of blue in places that really used to be red. Keep in mind, the only place that the, that, that the Democratic Party really mattered was the American South. And of course, it went for Roosevelt in 32, but so did most of the rest of the country. This is an absolute landslide victory that didn't just stop with Roosevelt. Uh, there were people that were elected to the House of Representatives, people that were elected to the Senate, more or less coattailing on Roosevelt's um, tidal wave in 1932. Now, critics of FDR 
would be very quick to point out that he was not the sharpest tool in the shed. He was no genius, not like Herbert Hoover was, right? Um, but what Franklin Roosevelt is going to do is he's going to surround himself with some very, very smart people. And it's going to be a term that one of Roosevelt's aides, a guy by the name of Samuel Rosenman, is going to call the brain trust. This is Roosevelt's cabinet, his presidential advisors. He's bringing in professors, PhDs, academics from places like Columbia University. I'm talking about people like Adolf Burley, Columbia University professor, who's going to become the Assistant Secretary of State under Franklin Roosevelt. Rex Tugwell, also a professor from Columbia University. He's going to become the Secretary of Agriculture. Probably most important is going to be Raymond Moley, uh, another Columbia University professor that is going to become the Secretary of Education, and he's actually going to coin the term New Deal that is going to just really serve to describe Franklin Roosevelt's first two terms in, in, in office, right? But what these guys are are really, really smart people, hence we have the term brain trust, and what they're doing with Franklin Roosevelt is they're advising him on the best ways to dig ourselves out of the Great Depression. Now, what Roosevelt is going to launch upon his inauguration is something that he calls the New Deal, right? For your notes, what the New Deal is, is a government program designed to get the American economy back up on its feet again and running. That's what it's designed to do. An ambition of which, I might point out, is never accomplished. It's not the New Deal that lifts us out of the Great Depression. It's World War II, as you're going to find out. But the star of the New Deal is this program that comes to be known as the National Recovery Act, the NRA. What the NRA did is what Herbert Hoover was advising, except it didn't make it a choice. It made it mandatory. What it said was there would be codes placed in the American economy that would regulate how many hours you could work, how many days you could work. It would tell employers how many people they could lay off. Um, it would tell employers how they would have to run their business. It was designed to stabilize prices. More than anything else, it was designed to put a bottom floor on the American economy. What it's trying to do is to keep people working, and if at all possible, get more and more and more people working. But unlike Herbert Hoover, who wanted Americans to make these sacrifices voluntarily, the NRA mandated them. Right? This is certainly not going to be the last time that we talk about the NRA, but it's the NRA that will usher in just an absolute wave of what historians call alphabet soup, right? There are all of these government programs, all of which are associated with the New Deal, and they're all designed to do the same thing. Get Americans to spend money again, restore the bottom floor of the American economy, and build it back up. Now, despite what you might hear in certain news circles, Franklin Roosevelt was no radical. Um, as a matter of fact, you could even make the case that his first 100 days starts out pretty conservatively. The Economy Act in 1933 actually cut federal spending, but more importantly, it was banking that Roosevelt had to address, had to, had to stop the bleeding in banking, right? What he's going to do is he's going to issue something called the Emergency Relief Banking Bill. This doesn't nationalize the banks. What it does is it provides the banks with a banking holiday, a long weekend. This is a long time before ATMs, long time before debit cards. So if you can't get into the bank, you can't take any money out of the bank. That is a solution to a problem. But one of the things that Roosevelt does, because he understands that once those banks reopen, there's probably going to be more bank runs like what we've talked about in this class before. So to kind of calm everybody's nerves, he says when those banks reopen, they will reopen with the support of the federal government. If you've been to the bank semi-recently, you might have noticed a little decal, a little sticker that said FDIC insured, Federal Depository Insurance Corporation, FDIC. 
If you read closely, that will tell you that if you put your money in that bank, the federal government will guarantee your deposits up to, I believe it's $250,000. So the safest place in the world for your money would be the bank. If the bank goes under, if it makes terrible decisions and goes broke, if John Dillinger robs it, you're going to get every last dime of it back, right? It's designed to restore faith in the banking system, okay? Now, that's one thing, but Roosevelt is going to push the envelope one step further. Roosevelt is really going to be the first president in American history to benefit from this mass communication device that we've called the radio. And he would conduct these things that he called fireside chats. And in the aftermath of his passing of the emergency relief banking bill, he went on the radio waves and he said in a wonderful voice, right, much like Ronald Reagan, he had a voice that just soothed you. He said, my fellow Americans, I'd like to talk to you today about the system of banking, right? He went on to say, we have developed a terribly unfashionable habit of hoarding. People are taking their money out of the bank and they're stuffing it in their mattresses and they're burying it in their backyards and they're putting it in their ice boxes. And this is a terrible, terrible practice and it's really, really ugly. And so what I want you to do when the banks reopen on Tuesday is I want you to march right downtown and I want you to put every last dime back into the bank. And people ate it up like a spoon or with a spoon, right? They, 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 they lined up, but this time they were not asking to take their money out. They were putting their money back in. It's Franklin Roosevelt's charm and his communication ability, two things that Herbert Hoover desperately lacked, that really go a long, long way to restoring faith in the American system. Now, the other thing that they're going to do to really buttress the system of banking is they're going to pass a bill that comes to be known as the Glass-Steagall Act. What Glass-Steagall is going to do is it's going to put a firewall in between investment banking, what J.P. Morgan does, and personal banking, what you and I do, right? Uh, write checks, make deposits, use our debit cards, all that good stuff, right? What it means are the investment bankers, people like J.P. Morgan, they can't gamble with depositors' uh, money the, the way that they had been able to in the 1920s leading up to the crash. It's designed to stabilize banking. It does, but it makes Wall Street a relatively boring place. Uh, you'll see why this is so important once we get to the 1980s. But for right now, that is Roosevelt's first order of business in his first 100 days in office. It's to, to buttress the American banking system. He's also got to clean up what's going on in the farm. If there was one group of people that did not roar through the 1920s, but more or less limped, it was farmers. And part of the reason was um, they, had, uh, they had gotten used to those great farm prices for what they were producing in the war years. And now when Europeans went back to farming, they, they weren't getting the same amount of money for their bushel of wheat or for their corn, right? The basic problem is overproduction. And Roosevelt understands this. And so what he does is he subsidizes American farmers through something called the Agricultural Adjustment Act. It essentially pays farmers not to farm their farms, not to produce anything, to let supply and demand sink back up again. Now, this is great if you own your own land. It's not great if you happen to be a tenant farmer. And all across the American South, just for instance, over 40% of the people that would describe themselves as farmers, um, they did not own their land. And when their landlords, when the person that did own the land said, thanks, I no longer need your services, they were out of a job. They were out of luck. And in a way, it actually added fuel to the fire. Um, so mixed bag in terms of success. The National Industrial Recovery Act, it provides codes to industry, including the ability of workers, for the first time in American history, the ability of workers to form unions. Uh, the Civilian Works Administration, which would later become the Works Progress Administration, this is going to put Americans to work on public projects, similar to what he had done in New York, but this time on a national scale. One of my favorites, the Tennessee Valley Authority, the TVA. One of the things that Roosevelt wanted to do 
was not only restore the American economy, but also raise the standard of living. And what the Tennessee Valley Authority is going to do is it's going to provide electricity to a part of the country, the southeast, that, that hadn't really had access to it right at that moment. It's going to harness the natural resources of the south, the rivers and the streams and everything like that, none, none of which was in any kind of real shortage. It's going to harvest that power and it's going to use that power to lay a new electrical grid. And, and really bring electricity to the South. But best of all, it's going to do that by rounding up unemployed Southern workers, and you guessed it, putting them to work on the government's dime. What Franklin Roosevelt is really trying to do is he's trying to put money into the hands of average, everyday Americans. This approach is going to become known as the bubble up economy. You're, you're, you're injecting resources at the bottom of the American economy and you're hoping that that is going to bubble up and create demand up here for the Henry Fords and the John Rockefellers and the Cornelius Vanderbilts of the world. And in some ways he's successful in the sense that it does certainly ease the effects of the Great Depression and in some ways he's never really able to get over that hump. Right? You'll see what I mean once we get to World War II. But for right now, I want to talk about the death of the New Deal. A very untimely death. In 1935, there were two poultry processors, chicken meat processors, from Brooklyn, New York, by the name of Sketchter, right? And the Sketchter brothers uh, resented the interference of the federal government in what they deemed to be their private enterprise. One of the things that the NRA, National Recovery Act, said was you have to use a minimum quality of whatever it is that you're producing. In their case, it was chicken meat, so you had to use a minimum quality of chicken meat. Otherwise, the government's going to come in and is going to shut you down. Well, the Sketcher brothers said, we're not taking this lying down. You don't get to tell us what we can do, would not do in our private enterprise. So they sued the federal government, and they won. What the Sketcher decision is going to do in 1935 is, is basically deem the NRA unconstitutional. Nowhere in the Constitution does it say that the federal government can say to private producers what they can use and what they cannot use. You never have that power and that authority. In the process, this is going to send everything involving the New Deal right back to the drawing board. It's going to knock down the entirety of the New Deal. Now, it's not going to knock down the TVA or the WPA or anything like that, but understand something. The NRA was the central issue within the New Deal, and if it is deemed to be unconstitutional, there's a very good chance that everything else is coming down with it. So it's going to force everybody to start over from scratch. It's also going to make the Supreme Court the number one target of Franklin Roosevelt, and you'll see what I'm talking about the next time we meet. For right now, I want to talk about the second New Deal. Because out of the ashes of the first New Deal from 1933 to 1935, you will see the growth of what historians call the Second New Deal. And what I want you to understand about the Second New Deal is that in addition to trying to restore the American economy, it's also very much going to uh, uh, underscore the importance of social justice. Now, as I said before, the Second New Deal is going to push Franklin Roosevelt further to the left. And one of the things that his critics are going to begin screaming about, the deficits. You're mortgaging our children's 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 future with this New Deal spending, right? You're spending us into our own demise. You're spending us into our grades. Where's the money coming from, Mr. President? Where are you going to get the money from? And in 1935, in what comes to be known as the Wealth Act, Franklin Roosevelt says, I'll tell you where it's going to come from. It's going to come from you good folks, right? It's going to come from wealthier Americans. If you make $50,000 or more, your taxes are going to go up. That's where I'm going to get the money from, right? Now, $50,000 seems very middle classy by our standards. It is. But understand something else. In 1935, the average American household income was only $6,300. So if you're making $50,000 or better, you're doing just fine for yourself. Opponents called this the Silk the Rich campaign, right? People that were deep supporters of not only Franklin Roosevelt, but of his New Deal, 
and some of the ways that it was addressing uh, institutionalized poverty were really, really big fans of this. Um, something else that is going to garner Franklin Roosevelt a lot of support is his support of the 1935 Wagner Act. Now remember guys, when I said that the Sketcher decision knocked down every part of the New Deal, it also knocked down the part whereby workers were allowed to form unions. Um, in any case, um, what Wagner is going to do is, is reestablish this idea that uh, workers have the right to form unions. The Wagner Act is going to give workers the right to form unions, and it's going to oblige their bosses, their employers, to bargain collectively with them. Now, Roosevelt really didn't put a lot of time and effort into Wagner. He, he kind of appealed to his Secretary of Labor, a woman by the name of Frances Perkins, to team up with Robert F. Wagner, a uh, senator from New York, and together they're going to shape this law, but he did support it. If, if you're looking at the PowerPoint there again, what Roosevelt said was, if I ever went to work in a factory, the first thing I would do is join the union. And these union organizers are going to take that and run with it. The president wants you to join a union. Okay. What Roosevelt is going to dig into very, very deeply is a program that he will call Social Security. What Roosevelt wanted to give to the American people is what security he had known from a very, very early age. Keep in mind, one, one misstep, one untimely accident, like Jurgis Rutgers had with his ankle, and that can land you in the poorhouse. That can land you in the streets. And Roosevelt just became determined to reverse that trend. And that's what the Social Security Act was designed to do. On its most basic of levels, what Social Security is, is an old age pension. It's something that you pay into. Even today, you pay into it, right? You pay into Social Security, and once you reach a specific age, you're allowed to retire, and you get a monthly check from the government. That's your Social Security. It's not much, but it's certainly something more than what you would have gotten before any of this, right? In addition to that uh, pension, there's what we call, it's, well, it's literally Social Security. If you have an accident, if you, if, if you have an accident at work that makes you go blind, right, it's not a death sentence the way that it was in the Gilded Age. It is a situation whereby you will qualify for that government assistance, and so it's not a situation where you are now pretty much destitute. Well, the American people just absolutely love this. The group that didn't love this so much, that was your wealthier Americans. Roosevelt's making himself enemies at the same time that he's making himself friends as well. All of this leads us into the election of 1936. In every poll in the United States, Reuters, AP, you name it, they all had Franklin Roosevelt going down in flames to his Republican challenger, Senator from Kansas, a guy by the name of Alf Landon. And part of the reason for this is that in the 30s, they, they took these polls based on the telephone. And the telephone was things that mostly only wealthier Americans had in their homes. I get the sense that many of you are beginning to connect these dots, right? And so Roosevelt was deeply, deeply unliked by, by even people of the upper middle class variety, especially unliked by, by people like J.P. Morgan, who could not even bring himself to call Roosevelt by name. He used to call him that man in the White House, saw him as a traitor to his own class. Well, all of this is boiling to the point of the Democratic National Convention in 1936. Madison Square Garden, Roosevelt goes in front of the American people and he says, for four years you have had an administration that has rolled up its sleeve and has gotten hard at work to restore the economy. And I can assure you that we will stay hard at work. He goes on the attack, he goes on the offensive. He said, they, the opponents of Franklin Roosevelt, they had come to assume that the government was an appendage of their own power. He says, we now know that government by organized money is just as dangerous as government by organized mob. 
And he said, nowhere before has these forces of monopoly, of, of laissez-faire capitalism, never before have they been more united in their hatred of one political candidate than they are united in their hatred of me, and I welcome their hatred. In other words, you want me for four more years. If people like J.P. Morgan don't like me, there's got to be a very good reason for it. And if you recall people like J.P. Morgan, people like Henry Ford, whose credibility had been destroyed by the Great Depression, right? That went a long, long way. And Madison Square Garden began to erupt, right? So much so that Roosevelt had to wait minute after minute after minute just to get them to quiet down. And when they finally did, he said, I would like to have it said of my first administration that in it, these forces met their match. When you meet your match, you meet somebody who's going to stand up to you. He said, I would like to have it said of my second administration, this wait, wait, begin to erupt again. I would like to have it said of my second administration that in it, these forces met their master. In other words, we banished these forces of monopoly uh, for, for the rest of American history. And with that, the roof came off of Madison Square Garden. It was absolutely pandemonium. And so my point is, yeah, Roosevelt made himself some powerful enemies within the American economy and even to a lesser extent, American politics as well. But <laughs> that's an even bluer map than the first one that I showed you. 1936 is a, an enormous landslide. It's even more pronounced than, than 1932. It looks like somebody spilled a little bit of ketchup in the, in, the, in the extreme Northeast. But even Pennsylvania, which was the bedrock of Republicanism throughout the early 20th century, even Pennsylvania turned, turned blue this time. Depending on how you define it, 1936 is the greatest political landslide in American history. And not only is it a landslide, it's a political transition. With the election of Abraham Lincoln in 1860, all the way to 1928, it was the Republican Party that had been the dominant party, right? Not just more times than not do you have a Republican president or Republican-controlled Congress, but our political culture, the idea that government uh, needed to stay out of business, that was more or less the political culture that was accepted in, in that time period. And now all of that is beginning to change, right? Along with Franklin Roosevelt, more senators, more congressmen were elected. But not only so much that, the Democratic Party is beginning to replace the Republican Party as the more dominant party. Liberalism is beginning to replace conservatism as the dominant political culture. You're beginning to see the formation of these voting alliances, what's going to come to be known as the New Deal Coalition, will include organized labor. They like Franklin Roosevelt because he gave them the right to form unions. African Americans will begin to switch political teams here. Keep in mind, before 1936, they generally voted for Lincoln's party that had freed the slaves. That'll change. And to some extent, that's still very much the case. African Americans do tend to vote more for Democrats than they do on the large part for, for, for Republicans, right? Uh, farmers. Uh, we know that ever since William Jennings Bryan, uh, the Democratic Party was the party of the farmers. Regionalism doesn't, doesn't matter anymore. You can see the West Coast is as blue as the American South, which is as blue as the industrial heartland. So in ways it's odd bedfellows, but in ways you can see this New Deal coalition is a massive force to be reckoned with in American politics, and it is absolutely going to be a game changer when it comes to the course of American history. And with that, I know this is one of our longer lectures. With that, I will see you next time.